What's up, everybody? Welcome to Putting Our Power. This is Gabby. I'm flying solo today. That's all right. We're going to get the ball rolling. As y'all know, all the links are in the description for Patreon. If you'd like to donate to what we're doing, if you'd like to join us in person, links in the description. You can hit us up on social media at Building Our PWR. All right, guys, we're going to keep the conversation going um, where we left off, which was page 48 of um, Blade in My Eye. But I'm going to go back up so we can kind of contextualize what we were talking about. Um, And so going to the first paragraph that starts this thought um, on 47, it says... Our present task is to illustrate this point forcefully to the people. The fascist industrial state can organize a ponderous, mechanized violence, but this systematic industrially based holding action is helpless before the fluid, mobile, self-impelled attrition of people's urban guerrilla warfare. With his techniques fully developed and established, the urban guerrilla launches his attacks on the corporate military police complex with some of these military objectives in mind. To weaken the local guards or the security system of a dictatorship, given the fact that we are attacking the guerrillas defending, which means catching the government in a defensive position with its troops immobilized in defense of the entire complex of national maintenance with its ever present fears of an attack on its strategic nerve centers and without ever knowing where, how and when that attack will come. To attack on every side with many different armed groups, few in number, each self-contained and operating separately to disperse the government forces in their pursuit of a thoroughly fragmented organization instead of offering the dictatorship the opportunity to concentrate its forces on repression on the destruction of one tightly organized system operating throughout the country. To give proof of its combativeness, Decision, firmness, determination, and persistence in the attack on the military dictatorship in order to permit all malcontents to follow our example and fight with urban guerrilla tactics. Meanwhile, the government, with all its problems, incapable of halting guerrilla operations in the city, will lose time and suffer endless attrition and will finally be forced to pull back its repressive troops in order to mount guard over the banks, industries, armories, military barracks, prisons, public offices, radio and television stations, North American firms, gas storage tanks, oil refineries, ships, airplanes, ports, residents of outstanding members of the regime, such as ministers and generals, police stations and official organizations, etc. To increase urban guerrilla disturbances gradually in an endless ascendancy of unforeseen actions such that the government troops cannot leave the urban areas to pursue the guerrillas in the interior without running the risk of abandoning the cities and permitting rebellion to increase on the coast as well as in the interior of the country. To oblige the army and the police with the commanders and their assistants to change the relative comfort and tranquility of their barracks and their usual rest for a state of alarm and grow tension in the expectation of attack or in search for tracks that vanish without a trace. To avoid open battle and decisive combat with the government, limiting the struggle to brief and rapid attacks with lightning results, to assure for the urban guerrilla a maximum freedom of maneuver and of action without ever relinquishing the use of armed violence, remaining firmly oriented toward helping the beginning of rural guerrilla warfare and supporting the construction of the Revolutionary Army for national liberation. Okay, so here, um, it's very interesting. He's talking about different methods of guerrilla warfare, and it's from my understanding of guerrilla warfare, it's um, kind of just using that element of surprise. Um, like he said, small groups of of people attacking um, the enemy from all different directions and then uh, quickly retreating, pretty much catching these people off guard and um, wrecking havoc. And one of the, the methods he was saying, is we have to keep these people in constant paranoia, pretty much, by attacking places that they would think are safe, tranquil. We can go to the barracks, or we can go over here. They have to always have their head on a swivel. And then they have to fear, you know, taking all their troops and concentrating them to where they think the attacks are coming from because there's going to be people 
in the cities that are ready to get stuff popping as well. So pretty much just uh, talking about different tactics that can be used um, when trying to accomplish uh, certain activities. We'll say that. Prestige is an abstract and intangible. It has no material basis, no substantial objective reality to be perceived through the senses. One can't touch it or taste it. It can't be heard. So how does it exist subjectively in the mind's eye after the fact of some connected circumstances that may also have been subjective? We're looking for connections. The materialist approach is to examine things in their total sequence, see them in process, not to merely establish their being in fixed sequential images, but to take in the state of being in process, infancy, maturity, decline, things in motion, process into other things in motion. We're constantly laboring to determine that which governs, regulates, motivates all the separate but related and interrelated processes. From the viewpoint that consciousness is determined by dialectical objective developments. Uh, so he's talking a little bit about dialectical materialism. We did a podcast episode on this like shoot, like a year and some change ago. We were talking about historical materialism and dialectical materialism. And um, in layman's terms, um, it's pretty much taking the material world, material uh Things that we can see, feel, and observe, and uh, using that to um, understand the world. So, for example, you can say, well, why is there an uptick in all this transphobia and all this other stuff? And most people would just be like, well, it's just because the Republicans are just... They're just getting more powerful, and it's just because, you know, Christianity. No, no, no analysis, just vibes. A dialectical materialist approach would be saying, okay, let me see, what, what type of circumstances are we at? Okay, pandemic, still in the middle of a pandemic, recession, inflation. People are economically anxious, looking for answers. So we're starting to delve into something familiar. Mm, I think it's fascism. So then you go back to fascist, fascist leaders, fascism, Hitler, and all these things. You look at what were the conditions that he was, you know, pushing his ideology of the, the great Aryan race and all that stuff. And you can make connections like that. It, it's not just... Coming up with theories and just throwing it up in the air like we like to do on Twitter. I'm, I'm guilty of this too. But it's looking at the world and connecting the dots and seeing how all things are related. And using this information and the information we know of the past to figure out and come up with ideas of what can we do to stop this and nip this in the bud and change things. Change the material reality so that we can change what, what's going on pretty much. All right. The prestige of power as a subjective effect of a past deed or reputation, real or fancied, then has a very definite life process. The prestige of the capitalist class inside the U.S. reached its maturity with the close of the 1860-64 Civil War. Since that time, there has been no serious threats to their power. Their excesses have taken on certain legitimacy through long usage. Prestige bars any serious attack on power. Do people attack a thing they consider with awe, with a sense of legitimacy? In the process of things, the prestige of power emerges roughly in that period when power does not have to exercise its underlying basis, violence. Mm, interesting. Having proved and established itself, it drifts secure from any serious challenge. It, uh, its automatic defense attack instincts remain alert. Small threats are either ignored away laughed away, or in some cases that may build into something dangerous, slapped away. To the masters of capital, the most dreadful omen of all is revolutionary scientific socialism. The grave digger evokes fear response. Prestige weighs if the first attack on its power base find it wanting. Prestige dies when it cannot prevent further attacks upon itself. 
all intellectual arguments against the necessity of counterviolence, even in the opening stage of a people's war against an industrial establishment such as the one in the U.S., are false. We can stop the debate. Prestige must be destroyed. People must see the venerated institutions and the omnipotent administrator actually under physical attack. They must be assured that the heavens will not hurl lightning bolts at the people's head for challenging the rights of property. Then, although international capitalism has shot its last bolts, it is not exactly harmless. If the threat to power is truly revolutionary, and the first step into revolutionary consciousness taken with a forceful attack upon prestige, we must anticipate reaction, accept repressions terror, and meet it with the counter-terror of our own. The grave digger needs a bodyguard to protect him at his work, else the grave may be his own. Okay, let's go back to this. Okay, so earlier, I know in the text he was talking about, you know, America has its aura. The West has its aura. This aura of being untouchable. This aura of being the big man on campus. And what George Jackson and his brother, again, are promoting is the concept that these people are not untouchable. The world will not end if you fight back. These people they are powerful, yes. But again, a lot of this stuff is psychological. Even like the big budgets and the big tanks and the big the guns and the big it's all to instill fear. That ain't not even been done yet. You're already fearful because you see, oh, they spending all this money on defense. They got the police guards with the with the shields and the electricity. They got the the uh, pepper spray. They got the helmets. They got the batons. A lot of this stuff is psychological to get you psyched out so that you're not even going to try nothing. And, of course, reinforcing this, this, this thought process that counter-terror is the only way to go. If we're truly revolutionary, if we're revolting, that is the only way to go and to take a hit to the prestige. To do something that makes people go, hmm, maybe, maybe these folks ain't as powerful as I thought. All right, back to the readings. The debate between the vanguard elements should end. The argument that the prestige of power will let itself to be educated away is too idiotic to be allowed to stand. Waiting for power to move to its inevitable collapse is suicidal for all concern. Blacks and other third world peoples have the very imminent prospect of genocidal tactics to contend with. And we can now all see that the modern industrial state, motivated by the interests of exclusive groups of capitalist masters, cannot relegate itself to make possible an inclusive production and distribution of goods or production without a massive waste of resources and destruction of all that stands about. The debate ends. The action begins. It is not a question of necessity of violence, but how to organize it to fit our unique situation, to tie it with flawless exactitude to our political activity, and to organize it immediately. Comrade George, I read recently from a textbook edited by my favorite writer, W. Pomeroy, that a city street could actually be considered as a defile. A convoy of any kind trapped in a defile on the countryside is easy prey for the forces positioned above it and about it. Jonathan. It is absolutely certain that every fascist military thinker and off official in the world has devoted time and study to the works of the great guerrilla tacticians Mao, Ho, Giap, Guevara, Pomeroy, Fanon, and Nkrumah. The fundamentals of people's war are no secret. It would seem that Giop's People's Army, People's War, or Guevara's Guerrilla Warfare, and the other masterworks on Poor People's War, once published for the world to study, would blunt their effectiveness at least a little. That is, until one has studied in depth and understood. Guerrilla Warfare, by its very nature, is invul invulnerable. Advanced scientific guerrilla strategy worked out over the first three quarters of this century is not contrary to popular image, merely a, quote, hit-and-run, haphazard affair. In spite of the need for improvisation and mobility, and in spite of its poverty and daring, it is scientific. 
The man who labored over its construction had as a task the forging of an instrument which would enable an indigent and weaponless people to resist and overcome a ponderous, mechanized army dependent upon an industrial base and operating on systematized thought. It is a perfect tool. Perfect. No establishment army can countervail it. The best example of this new fighting style, the urban guerrilla, is a spectacular success of the Tupamaros, the military arm of Uruguay, Uruguay's National Liberation Movement. Brilliantly organized, they have carried out well-planned or operations such as burning down plants, General Motors, without harming a single worker, robbing impregnable fortresses such as the casino of Punta del Este, kidnapping hated officials, ambassadors, and bankers, seizing the whole towns long enough to explain their purpose and revolutionary commitment, assassinating key repressive agents such as the chief of the police special squad, sabotaging imperialism's industrial military complexes, and raiding police military outposts to capture arms and ammunition. Grousey outlines their fighting strategy as follows. The objective is manifold. 1. To threaten the establishment, cause it to panic and make serious tactical mistakes, such as resorting to mass repression, which radicalizes the population against them. 2. To establish the underground revolutionary apparatus, including both active participants and trusted but passive collaborators, who will later carry out the liaison, communication, logistic, and propaganda needs of the revolutionary armies in the cities. To test new recruits and relative security. For though the police infiltrators are bound to creep in and stay in the organization for future need, even if they have to kill their own to do so, the fact that for a long time urban groups will operate independently of each other keeps sweeping arrests of urban guerrillas down to a minimum. 4. To demoralize the rank and file, and even the officers of the repressive forces, as they see themselves constantly but unexpectedly under attack. It is said that to kill policemen indiscriminately is to forget the working class background of the cop on the beat. This is as as absurd as trying to save the ordinary soldiers whom the Vietnamese must kill to survive. Number 5. To panic local capitalists to withdraw their funds from specific areas, thus hurting the local warlords and politicians who profit from these investments. To frighten away foreign investors, which will affect the whole bureaucratic oligarchy. Seven, to force the U.S. to constantly extend its intervention, which will tax its resources, hence discontent at home, and spread its imperialist arms, rendering it more vulnerable abroad. This is good. This is good. Okay, let's go back to these t- let's go back to these these points right here. Number 1. This is what he was talking about to have these people in a constant head swivel, not knowing what's coming up, not knowing what's coming next. And because they're not a part of this, they haven't infiltrated nothing and it's effective what they're doing, what we're doing. It's going to cause them to go all boots on the ground, bring out everybody. And he said the repression of that will garner more support for us. Now, we can look to the George Floyd stuff. Now, as far as our people, whether I mean, I'll say majority of black working class people, them seeing the cops getting beaten people in the streets made people hate the cops more. It didn't necessarily make them on the cop side. And so in that regard, the repression and the the response to what we do can be a tool of getting people on board for what we're trying to do. Um, so again, of course, talking about keeping stuff on the ground as long as you can, not project into the world, what in the world you about to do, get off social media. It needs to be underground. Um, and talking about, like what Jonathan was talking about, tests, um, ways to filter out people, do your very best to keep out infiltrators as much as possible um, to make sure, you know, things are going successfully. Um, 
And then he, he was talking about, you know, just make it so hard for these cops that they're just like, I'm going to quit. Like, it's so hard for these people that they're just like, I can't do it no more. I can't do it no more. And some of that happened during the George Floyd stuff. People was like, uh-uh. People don't like the cops no more. We're not getting respected. I'm going to leave. That's what we want. That's what we need to happen. That's what needs to continue to happen. And then they were talking. he was talking about, you know, people say, well, the, the cops are working class. The cops, they have unions too. That is, no, no, no. When it comes to certain things, this is why Marx and his little analysis is not, it don't go far enough. It's not just about your relation to capitalism. It's about what side you were on. My gosh. Were the overseers during slavery times, were they working class? Technically, yes. Technically, if we're going by the book, they were working class. Okay. But were their interests... The same interests as the slaves? Or were their interests the same interests as the bourgeois? And were they working to keep people in slavery? Yes. So we can't just keep stuff just, well, working class, we must all stay together. No, we must not. If your ideals and your goals and your job is to help reinforce this this system, you're not a part of us, and we don't have no allegiance to you. Um, so he was talking about pretty much that number five was like hit the pockets, like make these folks scared to invest in what we got going on. And I feel like that can be a good tool, like an anti gentrification tool. Um, as far as, you know, making these investors scared to come over here and start gentrifying. You know, I've seen them memes and them TikToks of people like getting their guns and shooting, uh, shooting out in the abyss, you know, to keep the uh, property and the rent properties uh, rates down. And I mean, that can be a tactic. That might be something you want to look into. How can we safely though not necessarily shoot no gun how can we safely make these capitalists and stuff stop investing in the cops stop investing in our the gentrification of our neighborhoods um and uh yeah that's pretty much what he was talking about um so these are some very good tips. I like this. Um, and I think that's something we all need to look into. Um, we're thinking about tactics and how we're going to operate um, when we get when we get into it and doing it. Y'all got to talk in code on, on the uh, Spotify and on the YouTube and stuff like that. But definitely I want y'all to do y'all own readings, get together, organize, and y'all plan stuff out legitimately. Um, and we're going to do it too. All right. At this point, I must make clear that I'm not, I am certainly not warning the military establishment or their capitalist masters, nor am I advocating the overthrow of the established American government. <laughs> when I use the initials USA in these observations, it must be understood that I could quite as easily be referring to the Union of South Africa. USA. I like that. <laughs> the government of the USA and all that it stands for, all that it represents must be destroyed. This is the starting point and the end. We have the means to this end. The problem is to develop acceptance of their use. The first struggle is one waged within our own minds. We must, in all haste, transcend the intellectual inhib inhibitions that preclude support of at least the minimum level of violence that must develop concomitantly with each political thrust. Our attitudes must change before we can expect any response from the people, workers, student, lumpen pro proletariat. We must accept the eventuality of bringing the USA to its needs, accept the closing off of critical sections of the city with barbed wire, armored pig carriers, crisscrossing of, the street, of city streets, soldiers everywhere, Tommy guns pointed at stomach level, smoke curling black against the daylight sky, the smell of cordite. House to house searches, doors being kicked in, the commonness of death. Then we must learn the forms of resistance, the booby trap, the silence, pistol and rifle, the pitting of streets to slow them down, the wrecking of heavy equipment to block their efficient movements, false walls, hidden sub basements, tunnels, Vietnamese style, 
destruction of the critical elements of the facilities that support establishment order. We must learn the value of infiltration. It works better for us than it does for the opposition. We simply stop allowing ourselves to be hunted and do some stalking of our own. Their secret police aren't really too secret at all. Right now, we can go num numbering, naming, compiling information on them all. They're too visible to be safe. Revolution is aggressive. Just where are we? Where is this country getting to? In the morning, the fight will have begun. And considering all the establishment's protective agencies, even those that are quasi-secret, none can hide themselves. Any establishment, institution, or organization that enjoys prestige that exists openly above ground is by definition weak, or at least vulnerable to a determined attack. When the purpose of your military tactics is to build and guard some object or point of supposed advantage, the defender can actually be thought of as being under siege, the guard himself a standing target. The fortress and all its resources, mechanized and human, for all its imposing strength, cannot exist for long under persistent attack. Deprived of the opportunity to replenish, repair, renew itself. If the opposing military forces that have laid the siege are nameless, faceless, numberless, indistinguishable from all the millions that exist all about the establishment. When the establishment's military forces sally forth their beleaguered fortress to do battle, what must be the result? They must cause suffering to the innocent, since it is impossible for them to know to know us, making new enemies. They will restrict the freedom of our known or suspected political parties and projects that are wielded to the people, thus restricting the freedom of others who may have been neutral or sympathetic to them. They will make themselves targets for our hidden machine guns, sniper rifles, silent pistols, mortar, anti-tank rocket, flamethrower. Okay, I want to talk about this part right here. He was talking about... Uh, You know, for us, there's a lot of things that we have to realize if this is what we're trying to accomplish will be the reality of it all. You know, we talk about the violence. We talk about having to use weapons. But we we also need to talk about, like, just the, the reality of living through that. It's not just going to be a one-day thing. It's going to be a a process. Who knows how long it will take. And mentally, you have to be prepared to to be in that. You have to already know what's coming up. You have to already, you know, that that's a must. And so uh, he was saying along with that, now that we know this information, what are some things that can help us while we're going through this? He was talking about, you know, the booby traps and the, the weapons and stuff like that. Um. So, something else he was saying is, you know, with being uh, underground and not necessarily known and not necessarily located in a specific place, popping up all over the place, it may get to a point where they can't tell the difference between, are you a quote-unquote protester, are you a citizen? And they will start to just go ham on everybody, which is something that happened during the George Floyd protest. And again, that helped make the case for what we were trying to do and what we were trying to say. The only difference is what a lot of this stuff that he said has happened. The only difference was there was no organization there. There was nothing there when people when everything was done and all the, the dust had cleared. Everybody was shuffling everybody into the polls. And that was it. We got people to the point where they were thinking about maybe the police aren't good people. Maybe it's not just bad apples at this point. Maybe there's something inherently there. And what happened? Oh, go vote, go vote. The police are good. We're going to give more money to the police. Uh, we don't need to defund the police. We need the police. And then propaganda all about the crime. Oh, they're doing this. They're beating people up here. They're doing this here. They're doing this here. And so whatever momentum that was had was lost. And we're pretty much back on square one. Because we talk about defunding the police now. With the majority of the people, 
you finna get you finna get some pushback. So yeah. It is encouraging though to see like this dude, nineteen seventies, he peeped like these are strategies that will work as far as getting the public on our side, which will be number one of the number one things. Because we may not be able to win them with the words. We may not be able to win them just with the rhetoric of the preaching or whatever. But the stuff they see with their eyes, the stuff they peep themselves, the things they will experience during that time will be one of the biggest radicalizing factors that we have. So, all right, guys, that was the beginning of page 56. We'll get back into it uh, next week. Uh, Tell me what y'all thought about it. Put it in the comments. You have anything you'd like to add to the discussion? Again, uh, Patreon is in the description. You'd like to donate to what we're doing in this community. Link is in the description. Again, we're still trying to raise money for coats for people. Um, the main organization that is over those specific community fridges that we donate to. They're trying to do a food drive for Christmas. And so we want to help with that. Um, if you'd like to contribute to that, you can. Link is in the description. If you'd like to join us in person, you can do so. Link is in the description. We're going to be meeting up with some people in the near future to talk a little bit more about the Second Amendment and get some Second Amendment things going. Um, if you'd like to join us again, you can do so. All right, guys, this has been Gabby, and this has been Building Our Power.